This okay. is Karen Kohler. She's a lecturer in 19th century literature at Bangor University in North Wales. We were PhD colleagues, yeah. but being young and vital as opposed to my old self, she leapt ahead and finished way before I did. And now has a first monograph out, Thomas Hardy and Victorian Communication, Letters, Telegrams and Postal Systems. It was published by Palgrave last year. She has also published book chapters and articles on Hardy's short stories, Valentine's in Victorian literature, and his epistolary privacy in the 19th century literature culture. Her current project explores the role of letters and posts in Victorian poetry. And without further ado, Karen. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm very happy. Oh, sorry. I'm very happy to be here, and I'm really glad that the first Woodlander Study Day is on the well, the first Hardy Study Day is on the Woodlanders because that happens to be my favourite Hardy novel. I have a particular weakness for it. Um, I've made a very rudimentary PowerPoint, which just has the quotations that I'm going to be looking at. Um, I know that my former supervisor Philip, who just spoke, um, can spot a typo probably um, while walking past from about. Um, 10 miles away, so I'm very aware that there will probably be typos in here. I apologise in advance, but I'm going to get started now. Um, So in 1886, when Hardy would have probably been working on the serial version of The Woodlanders for Macmillan's magazine, he made the following notebook entry. January 6th. Misapprehension. The shrinking soul thinks its weak place is going to be laid bare and shows its thought by a suddenly clipped manner. The other shrinking soul thinks the clipped manner of the first to be the result of its own weakness in some way, not of its strength, and shows its fear also by its constrained air. So they withdraw from each other and misunderstand. These words strike me as peculiarly and particularly resonant um, in relation to the novel on which we are focusing here today. The Woodlanders is a novel full of misunderstandings, misreadings, misapprehensions, emotional withdrawals, failures of communications, and messages that are never quite spoken, never quite articulated. So in short, to borrow Hardy's own phrase, it is very much a novel of unfulfilled intention. Hardy's notebook entry particularly neatly summarises Grace and Giles' abortive relationship, which consists of so many what-if moments, moments in which if only one of them could have spoken their mind and heart or looked over their shoulder, as Philip said in his lecture, um, maybe, just maybe, things may have turned out differently. So Grace and Giles' tragedy, if we do want to call it that, is very much a tragedy of what remains unsaid, what isn't done, what must perhaps remain unsaid within the social backdrop in which their relationship unfolds. But in this paper, I want to focus not so much on the tragedies of what is not articulated. And of course, there are more than enough um, of these in Hardy's novels and poems, but on the tragedies that ensue when a character's most urgent acts of expression remain unheard or indeed unread in this particular context. So if the title and abstract of my paper hadn't already given it away, by this point you would probably have guessed that the character, or that this is a paper about Marty South, and we've already heard a lot about her, and we've had that wonderful final quotation and that very resonant image of Gertrude Bugler. Um, Marty South has a kind of choric function in The Woodlanders. So throughout, both in speech and writing, she makes very incisive and insightful comments on the novel's events in a manner that at times actually belies her supposed simplicity and her ingenuity, and that exists in a strange tension with her supposed ignorance of the ways of the world. Consider, for example, the frequently cited moment when she observes, and I can't resist putting that in here, um, that the trees, the young trees that she and Giles are planting, sigh directly, we put them upright, that while they are lying down, they don't sigh at all. And goes on to suggest that it is as if they sigh because they are very sorry to begin life in earnest, just as we be. Or, to cite my favourite example um, from the novel, um, there's the moment at which Marty observes the flotation that occurs early on in the courtship between Grace and Edred, Dr. Dread, dread, I'm going to, that's going to stick with me. The new village doctor. Um, so Grace has just encouraged Fitzpiers advances quite sudden, su- uh, subtly, but suddenly a diversion was created by the accident of two large birds that had either been roosting above their heads or nesting there, tumbling one over the other into the hot ashes at their feet, apparently engrossed in a desperate quarrel that prevented the use of their wings. They speedily parted, however, and flew up with a singed smell and were seen no more. That's the end of what is called love, said someone. 
And someone is, of course, Marty South. As it turns out, she could hardly be more to the point. The most characters in this novel end up with more than just a smell of singed wings um, when they fall in love, and we've heard all about that. Um, but it is a very incisive comment. Of course, despite the fact that what Marty has to say is usually worth hearing, or perhaps, since we're talking about Harty, precisely because of that fact, Marty's statements, written or spoken, will usually go unheeded, unheard, unread throughout the text. And in this paper, I want to consider a specific incident from the novel and suggest that it can serve as a microcosm of the novel's larger concern with unfulfilled intentions and unheard or unread words. So I'll close read the scenes in the novel that describe, that describe how Marty Stiles writes and then delivers a letter to Fitzpiers to inform him that his mistress, Phyllis Charmant, the lady of the manor, is of course wearing false hair that is made largely out of Marty's own. And Hardy's description of this letter quite precisely captures why Marty's words go unheard throughout the text. They reveal how the combined factors of class and gender deprive Marty of a voice and the ability to make herself heard and understood. So when Hardy first introduces Marty, and we've already heard about this, he de- um, describes her hand as red and blistering, blistering rather than blistered, um, which Philip really recently pointed out, from her work as a spa maker. He observes that, as with so many right hands born to manual labour, there was nothing in its fundamental shape to bear out the physiological conventionalism that gradations of birth show themselves primarily in the form of this member. Nothing but a cast of the die of destiny had decided that the girl should handle the tool, and the fingers which clasped the heavy ash shaft might have skillfully guided the pencil or swept the string, had they only been set to do it in good time." The words suggest that there is nothing natural or inherent about Marty's status, about her work, even though her, mud, but her body is clearly um, strongly marked by it, or beginning to be marked by it. Marty has been born to, not for, manual labour, and the dexterity which, with, 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 which, with which she handles her tours might as well have been channeled into more refined activities, writing, drawing, playing the piano, the kinds of things that Grace is being taught to do. At the same time, though, the quotation also implies that because economic necessity has prescribed work, the accidental circumstances of her birth are hardening into a permanent condition. So that's kind of that idea of the blisters or the blistering turning into calluses again. Um, And it's already in this early stage in her life, it seems like it's kind of becoming too late for Marty to alter her course. She's at the bottom of the local community social scale, and as the story progresses, all the path to mobility that Grace, for example, has at her disposal seem to be closed off to her. And in the minds of her fellow villagers, Marty is identified so firmly with her status that the novel's heroine, Grace Melbury, reacts with surprise when she passes the South's cottage one night and observes through the window that the girl is writing, girl's Marty, is writing instead of chopping as usual. For the well-read and cultivated Grace Melbury, this is an an incongruous scene. So I'm not going to say too much about this because I usually go on about the penny post at great length, but after the introduction of the penny post in 1840, um, letters became significantly cheaper and the postal service more accessible for a vast um, proportion of the population. And this meant that certainly in middle-class families, letter writing became quite a natural activity, quite an ordinary part of everyday life. But Grace's reaction to observing Marty's writing suggests that the fact that rural and urban labourers were too increasingly acquiring and using literary skills was perceived as a bit more ambivalent. So to to Grace, Marty's writing is not quite a natural sight. It's incongruous. It's somehow out of sync with her role and with her sphere. And more than that, the newly educated and socially mobile Grace finds herself wondering what her correspondence could be And the thought kind of betrays um, a middle-class preconception about the supposed limitations of a working-class experience and consciousness. So she can't quite imagine that a girl without her accomplishments, without her training, without her education, might be endowed with a depth of subjectivity that is comparable or even equal to her own. Grace struggles to conceive of a reason for Marty to express herself in writing. Why would she be doing that? She would be even more astonished to learn that Marty is drafting a letter which concerns the very events which have actually been at the forefront of um, Grace's own mind, in which she's very um, intricately involved. So as Hardy writes, I think this is 
situation. Nope, still this one. As Hardy writes, the rumour which agitated the other folk of Hintock, and this is the rumour regarding Grace's husband's affair with um, Phyllis Charmond, has reached the young girl and it leads her to pen a letter to Fitzpierce to tell him that Mrs. Charmond's magnificent pile of hair was made up of the writers more largely than of her own. And this letter provides us with one of the most poignant and effective uses of the epistolary device in all of Hardy's fiction. And I would suggest that it serves as a microscopic, but at the same time remarkably complete image of Marty's whole trajectory and whole role in the novel. So the woodland, as you know, begins and ends with Marty, and we've seen both of those moments in the um, in in the manuscript already, with her hair, she almost literally ties the different strands of the plot together. But on the first pages of the novel, Hardy already establishes that she will not really be an active force in this plot. She'll be perpetually used by other characters instead of acting on her own behalf, pursuing her own desires, her own needs. Initially, Marty refuses to sell her hair, despite Barbara Percombe's quite tempting offer of a sovereign, and he helpfully calculates that she would have to work for a week and a half to earn that much. But when she discovers that Giles Winterbourne, whom she loves, um, is not for her, to quote from the text, then Marty abandons this resolution. And in giving her away her only pretension to beauty, as Hardy phrases it, she also renounces her dream of kind of romantic fulfilment. And so from this woman, from this young girl with some even though limited hopes, she becomes gradually transformed into that motionless figure that we see at the end of the novel, who inevitably will turn into one of those stories. I know the woman, as Philip suggests. And in the act of writing to Fitzpiers, though, this letter that she writes to Fitzpiers marks a kind of resurgence of spirit, though maybe a compromised one. So soon after Marty's disappointment, of course, Giles' own romantic hopes are thwarted um, because he loses his cottage after Marty, Marty South's father's dead, death, and that also means he loses his standing in the village. Um, so Grace, acting partly under her father's pressure and partly through her own kind of class consciousness, marries um, Edward Fitzpiers instead. But although Giles' stroke of ill luck has not altered Marty's feelings, she remains passive, but she doesn't remain silent. She taught it tauntingly and pertinently, as it turns out, writes on his cottage wall, Oh, Giles, you've lost your dwelling place, and therefore, Giles, you'll lose your grace. And then months later, when it transpires that Grace is Grace's marriage is approaching collapse, Marty is prompted again to express herself in writing, because she sees danger to two hearts naturally honest in Grace being thrown back into Winterbourne society by the neglect of her husband. And this leads to the moment at which Grace observes her writing instead of chopping as usual, actually on Grace's behalf, um, which she can't possibly imagine. Hardy explains that the disclosure of Marty's secret was nope, still not was poor Marty's only card, and she played it, knowing nothing of fashion and thinking her revelation a fatal one for a lover. And it will be fatal, but not quite in the way Marty envisages. So in the first half of the sentence, Hardy suggests that writing to Fitzpiers is Marty's way of influencing events in which she is entangled. But the second half of the sentence already foreshadows that her endeavours will probably remain ineffective. Marty's ignorance of the world beyond the woods does not, does not, as Grace inadvertently assumes, disqualify her from writing, from articulating herself on paper. But it does lead her to overestimate the significance of what she has to write, what she has to disclose. Um, Marty's obliviousness to contemporary fashion, though, is not the only reason behind her miscalculation when she writes this letter. She also stumbles over this assumption that since the loss of her hair occupies quite a central place in her own life, it being so central for her, her only pretension to beauty, it must be of proportional significance for its new owner. She perceives this injustice of having to sacrifice her own natural beauty for the sake of artificially enhancing that of a richer woman. But she can't quite grasp that pervasive law of economic exploitation that runs through the village, which prescribes that some people must work, produce, and suffer so that others can consume, profit, and enjoy. And she overlooks the fact that some have her superiors, most of them might barely give a thought to the hardship that renders their way of life possible. The chapter that follows, though, reveals that rather than just being perused and then dismissed as inconsequential, as unimportant, Marty's letter is actually entirely ignored by its recipient. So Hardy describes how Fitzpiers received this document, and that happens in the following manner. 
As he approached the door of Marty's cottage, which it was necessary to pass on his way, she came from the porch as if she had been awaiting him and met him in the middle of the road, holding up a letter. Fitzpiers took it without stopping and asked over his shoulder from whom it came. And it's significant that Marty hesitates here for a brief moment before she answers with noticeable firmness. She seems uncertain as to whether she should tell the truth because she seems to be conscious that Fitzpiers might treat a communication from her with less consideration than he might treat a letter that comes from one of his equals or at least somebody closer to him in social standing. The fact that Fitzpiers never actually stops his horse, he never breaks his stride to take the letter, confirms the sort of disregard for Marty. And the inquiry about the author indicates that, like his wife, Grace, he can't quite imagine that Marty herself might be the correspondent. He seems to think that people like Marty carry the messages of others, but lack the emotional depth or intellectual acuity to write their own. So Marty does choose to identify herself as the letter writer, But she hesitates before she does that, and probably quite rightly so, because her answer, as we will see, perceptibly influences Fitzpiers' attitude towards the message that he will receive. So for Marty, everything is at stake in this brief interaction. She has awaited the opportunity to deliver this long, contemplated apple of discord, and she passes it with a trembling hand as... um, the final sentence here shows, but Hardy juxtaposes her faith and that the power that she hopes this writing will have with the revelation that the object barely managed to make it beyond the kind of um, very periphery of Fitzpiers' consciousness. So the narrator explains that it was impossible on account of the gloom for Fitzpiers to read it then while he had curiosity to do so, and he put it in his pocket His imagination, having already centred itself on Hintock House, in his pocket the letter remained unopened and forgotten, all the while that Marty was hopefully picturing its excellent weaning effect upon him. So several factors work against Marty here. There's not enough daylight for Fitzpiers to be reading her words right at this moment, and since Fitzpiers' mind is absorbed with thoughts of Mrs. Charmond, he cannot spare attention for a letter of which, ironically, Mrs. Charmond was, of course, the very subject. So in more senses than one, Marty delivers her message at exactly the wrong moment. Her recipient is physically and mentally unable to read and process the message she's given her. She's given him. But these incidental circumstances are not the main cause, of course, for the letter's ineffectiveness. The unopened and forgotten letter becomes quite an impeccable image, actually, for Marty's own condition, as it reflects how she, too, is persistently neglected by her fellow beings, who display as little interest in her inner life as Fitzpiers displays in the contents and what's inside the envelope of this letter, or presumably maybe behind the seal of this letter. We don't quite know what this letter actually looks like. So Felice Charmond feels justified in the selfish rape of Marty's locks because she's unwilling and unable to empathise with somebody as far removed from her own station as Marty. Charles Winterbourne, who's closer to Marty's own set social level and a good man and usually sensitive to others' needs remains oblivious completely to the depth of Marty's feeling for him. He fails to understand that he hurts her, for example, when he mocks her shorn appearance and callously compares her head to an apple upon a gatepost. And in fact, this lack of empathy runs through the entire Hintock community, which becomes particularly apparent after John South's death which causes Giles Winterbourne to lose his home. And everybody thought of Giles. Nobody thought of Marty. So the narrator comments that, had any of them looked in upon her during those moonlight nights which preceded the burial of her father, they would have seen the girl absolutely alone in the house with a dead man, lying in her little bed in the stillness of a repose almost as dignified as that of her companion the repose of a guileless soul that nothing more left on earth to, had nothing more left on earth to lose, except a life which she did not overvalue. But nobody does look in, because nobody does. Hardy might write in Jude the Obscure, he says something very similar. Um, they don't look in because they don't consider Marty worthy of notice as long as she plays her part in the village community, as long as she does the things people expect her to do. And in fact, these dynamics are sort of enacted by the very narrative itself, which opens and closes with Marty, but then relegates her to the very margins of the story. On account of her poverty and lack of education, she is treated almost as if she were not quite fully human, as if her consciousness, like her time and work, were worth less than those of her superiors. And so Fitzpiers cannot sustain his curiosity for long enough um, 
to actually read Marty's letter. And the social gulf between him and Marty seems to be literally too large for Marty to get that sort of small message across. The description of Marty's letter not only illustrates how class and gender affect the treatment she experiences at the hand of others, it also conveys her enforced lack of agency, though. Because, of course, when Marty's letter eventually is read in an unintended context, it wreaks much greater destruction than its author could possibly have intended or foreseen. So as Melbury informs Grace later on, on the continent, Fitzpiers chanced to pull it out in Mrs. Charman's present presence and read it out loud. It contained something which teased her very much and that led to the rupture. She was following him to make it up when she met with her terrible death at the hands of the mad gentleman from South Carolina. So in Great George Melbury's words, Marty's bullet reaches its billet at last. However, that's not quite what Marty had planned for, of course, because it is read so much later than intended. It becomes directly instrumental in Felice's death. And it yields another event, um, another result that Marty hadn't calculated. Um, It exceeds, not only exceeds, but defies Marty's intentions. So when Fitzpiers returns to Little Hintock, Grace, of course, seeks refuge refuge with Giles, who gives up his house to preserve her reputation, and then dies because he's already dangerously ill and insists on sleeping in the outhouse rather than staying in the cottage in his strange self-sacrifice. Notwithstanding its destructive consequences, within the greater scheme of things, Marty's letter might be merely a tiny instrument of a cause deep in nature, as the narrator puts it. It reaches Fitzpiers when he has already become a little wary of the situation, accelerating the inevitable. But in the context of her own life, this letter becomes a particularly poignant symbol, I think, of what Mar- Mary Jacobus has described at Marty's, as Marty's stillborn hopes. In a sense, letter writing might be considered as something quite empowering, of course, something quite liberating when compared to speech. The letter enables Marty to address a recipient who may not otherwise even condescend to engage with her. And in the letter, of course, she can, she can press herself without censure, with censure, without having to kind of think of the reaction that her words are going to produ- produce. She doesn't have to be afraid of being rebuked or silenced. But crucially, she can only do this in the letter. The letter is the only space in which she has the ability to express that. So believing in her own insignificance and her own inferiority, convinced that her voice is not otherwise going to be heard, she writes this letter. But by writing, she distances herself from the effect of her words, and she surrenders the power to determine their result. She cannot influence how or when they will be read, or she cannot even be sure that they will be read at all. Marty's letter is her only card because she's a poor woman with no friends or family to assist her. But for the same reason, this letter will be ignored, forgotten, and transformed into a far more devastating weapon than Marty had ever intended. So I think the fate of the letter really reflects Marty's central yet marginalised position in her community and indeed in the novel that describes this community. And that's it. (laughs) 